So I hope dinner was delicious and the conversations around your table were beautiful. Hopefully you have some ideas on how we will move forward after tonight to make sure you join Scholarship AZ's vision to make education accessible. One way we helped make it accessible was through, was through a collaboration with our partners, Spoken Futures. I'd like to invite Sarah Gonzalez, co-director of Spoken Futures, to introduce a collaborative project, Soñadoras Hablan, that brought two Soñad Poetry Slam artists together with Scholarship AZ leaders to learn how to write scholarship essays through the art of slam poetry. Please welcome Sarah. Good evening. My name is Sara Gonzalez. I am co-director of Spoken Futures Incorporated. It's a local business in town that um, is youth-run, youth-led to create opportunities for youth voice using the art form of spoken word poetry. So last year we were really glad to partner up with Scholarship AZ um, to do a program we call Sonia Dores Hablen. So we had our Tucson Youth Poetry Slam, which is a program of Spoken Futures, and Scholarship AZ and Pima Leaders from Pima Community College. So Pima Leaders and Scholarships AZ were all college students, and they taught our Tucson Youth Poetry Slam high school students how to apply for college and how to navigate the college application process. And in return, our youth poets taught them how to be more creative in their writing and how to be more confident when they were speaking for their presentations. It was a really great program to be a part of. I really enjoyed it because I, I truly believe in the idea of mutually beneficial cross-pollination and that we have all the knowledge that we need right here in the room. We just need to learn how to work with each other and share our knowledge. So I would like to introduce one of my high school students from Sunnyside High School. This is Jose Martinez, and he's one of our slam poets, and he just won the slam last night uh, at the Tucson Youth Poetry Slam. So please welcome Jose Martinez. Hey, how you guys? Uh, my name is Jose Martinez, and uh, I'm a senior at Sunnyside High School, and I'm read a poem for you guys. Grandma, the words, they stop dancing. My heart pumps blood for the first time, no ink. I don't want to write poetry right now. I'm done. I'm sick of this pen, I hate it. I've debated whether or not to stop for the past hours, so I apologize. The poet inside of me is dying. Don't cry for me. I've had too many poetic nightmares. Adjectives dance with my insecurities on this piece of paper. The boy who needed someone to listen has spoken. My ballpoint pen is running out of ink and the composition journal can hold my spirit no longer. I don't want to write poetry right now. Grandma. I wanted to be an artist. I never was much of a drawer, but I can paint pictures for blind men. I'm a poet. I create homes for secondhand dreams, but I don't want to write poetry right now. Grandma, I want to tell you I love you without having to use metaphors, but your tamale making hands forge me to the man I am today, and for that, I don't want to write poetry right now. For you, I want to blow up cafes with rhymes hotter than your homemade salsas. Because of you, I have a dream, porque si se puede. I don't want to write poetry right now. Quiero balar cumbias con palabras sobre el mundo. I want to make you proud. I want you to know that poetry will never teach me love like you did. I will never let you down. You came to America for us, so I'm writing this for you. This is not a poem, this is my thank you. Grandma, I will make it, I will make you proud. I will stand up for our people, Father Nuestra Gente. You taught me that anything is possible. You never cried in front of us because you were too strong for that. But I'm not as strong as you. I want your voice to cradle me to sleep. I'm scared, but I gotta keep fighting. No more crying, this is for, this is for you. This is not a poem, this isn't a prayer, this is a promise. Grandma, I've been having a hard time with these rhymes, but white those fly from my eyes when I cry my fears onto this piece of paper. It's safer for me to step back because I'm spitting fire. Grandma, I will never get tired as long as your hands lift me higher than any poet in this room. Do sangre, order por mis venas, y nunca va a bajar mi cabeza. Grandma, I know you pray for me. Thank you. I don't want to write poetry right now, but I'll write. For you.
beyond inspiring. Thank you so much and another round of applause. That was amazing. As we move forward tonight, we do start with the sense for need and creativity. And to bring a bigger sense to this, I'd like to introduce tonight's keynote speaker. Born in Puerto Vallarta, Jalisco, Mexico, Julio Navarrete and his family migrated to the United States in 1992 in search for a better life. He currently teaches Spanish at Sunday Public Schools in San Jose, California. Among many accomplishments, Julio helped design Things I'll Never Say, an online platform for documented youth across the country to create their own immigration narratives by boldly sharing their personal experience experiences through various forms of creative expression. Julio holds Master's of Education, Julio holds Master of Arts in Education from the National Hispanic University, a Bachelor of Arts in Radio, Television, Film, and Theater from San Jose State University, and a Spanish teaching credential in the state of California. Yesterday, Julio facilitated a creative writing workshop for our community at the University of Arizona and even made a guest appearance at the Tucson Youth Poetry Slam. Tonight, we welcome him to our stage as our keynote. Please give it up for Mr. Julio Navarrete. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. How are you doing? It's great to be here. I feel so honored, humbled, and privileged to be able to share this moment with you. I want to start off by thanking Matt Matera and Scholarships AZ for giving me the opportunity to speak with you tonight. My name is Julio Navarrete. I am undocumented and unafraid, queer and unashamed. I am 5'9", 29, 138, 408, and far from straight. Brown skin, brown eyes, black hair, and to dream I dare. Mexicano, Latino, Hispano, Chicano, Mexica, call me what you will because I am un ser humano. A teacher, a student, unico amigo y hermano. Naturally curious, born to succeed, legally wrong. Like a chameleon, changing colors, blending in, coming out, out of the closet, out of the shadows, into resilience. Slightly narcissistic, borderline eccentric, lightly sweet. I go with the flow, flow with the crowd, overflow with despair. And in my pockets I carry a scapulary, an old photograph and a million memories. My compassion, my devotion, and my insatiable hunger for change. A house that's falling apart, two guava trees and my pet pig. My desire for a better tomorrow. Un mañana feliz and waking up without fear. Despertar y saber que no estoy solo. Knowing that my generation took action. Que la sangre de nuestra sangre viva el fruto de esta lucha. Fighting for love and loving ferociously. Ver la furia de la paz y la calma de las guerras. Wars that cease to exist and fade away in the depths of our memories. Te regalo memorias verídicas de valentía y justicia. Let's fight for a world with respect, for dignity, for love, for justice, for the freedom to be who we choose to be. Ladies and gentlemen, we have a lot of work to do. We must unite as brothers and sisters, as human beings, to make this, our world, a better place. The year is 2013, and we're still fighting for gender equality, for LGBTQ rights, for education, for our environment, for immigration rights, the list goes on and on. We're still fighting for the unalienable rights we were promised. What do life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness look like? It isn't life without responsibility. It isn't liberty without mindfulness. It isn't happiness at the cost of, of other human beings. We all have a responsibility to ourselves, to each other, and to the world around us. We can work together to make our world a better place. And yes, we have a lot of work to do. The task is tough, the road is long, but we must carry on because eventually we will reach, reach dignity, respect, peace, harmony, and love for all of our sisters and brothers, mothers and fathers, daughters and sons on earth, because in the end, we're actually more alike than we think. Though our bodies beg to differ, you and I, are not different. When the blade of injustice penetrates our skin, we bleed the same. Bleed the rhythm of hopeful hearts. Bleed the pain of starving children. Bleed the struggle of forgotten lives we bleed. Our hearts, our children, our lives flowing through our veins like raging currents caused by hurricanes. 
Though our curves and our muscles, our hair and our stature swear on their mother's grave that you and I are different, I beg to differ. Because our passion, our compassion and devotion live in every crevice, every cell and DNA of our anatomy. Because our love, our spirituality and emotion live in every second, every breath and vitality. Though our eyes and our skin tone, our sweat and our skeleton beg to differ, you and I are not different. When the bullet of discrimination pierces through our hearts, we are wounded the same. Wounded by the gulfs of humanity, wounded by the shadows of pain, wounded by the silence of innocence. The gulfs, the shadows, the silence, infecting every breathing wound of rejection. You and I are the same and together we will survive this desolation. Brothers and sisters, together we're powerful and we're making so much progress. Sometimes we often forget that we also need to take care of ourselves. In order to be able to give our maximum energy, our time, our effort to the things that we're most passionate about, it's important that we allow ourselves to step back, to breathe, to reflect, to celebrate our accomplishments. A week ago, I celebrated my 29th birthday, and it was beautiful to be able to reflect upon all that has happened this past year. This May, I received my Master of, Master of Arts in Education. Thank you. <laughs> I was the first person in my family to go to college. When I received my bachelor's degree in 2005, my parents were overflowing with pride. And now to have received my master's is beyond what they could have ever imagined. I also got married. Thanks to DOMA being repealed, I was able to marry the most humble, the most loving man that I've ever known. And this year, I also received work authorization through my political asylum case, which is still pending final approval in DC, but because of it, I'm also able to return to the classroom as a high school Spanish teacher. Yay. I often get the question, how are you able to teach if you're undocumented? And my response has always been, con muchas ganas, which, which roughly translates to with a lot of desire. But the truth is that the reason I'm able to teach the reason why I've been able to accomplish all that I've done is because I'm not alone. There are so many people who have risked and supported me along the way. They've risked so much. So many people who have sacrificed so much in order for me to, to be able to achieve my dreams. The fact that I'm able to stand before you today and openly state that I'm an undocumented teacher speaks to the hard work that the undocumented youth movement has done to battle the stigma of coming out as undocumented. It speaks to the progress that we've made in opening doors for undocumented young people all over the country. On June 15, 2012, I joined more than 100 undocumented students in effectively shutting down the Immigration and Customs Enforcement building in downtown Los Angeles. Yay. Dozens of police officers, dozens of police officers blocked off the surrounding streets, they re redirected traffic, Immigration agents formed a perimeter around their building, shouldering their guns. We sat in the middle of the streets, holding brightly painted protest signs and chanting louder than their sirens for just immigration reform. A helicopter circled above us and countless cameras, microphones and reporters hovered. That same morning, President Obama made the announcement that his administration would be granting deferred action and work authorization to eligible undocumented youth. A few days later, when I arrived back home in San Jose, my mother, who cleans houses for a living, greeted me with a smile that stretched from ear to ear. She knew what this policy change meant for me. She had seen how difficult it was for me when I lost my dream in January 2011. After four years of teaching high school, I was let go when the school found out about my immigration status. I was eight years old when my family and I moved to San Jose, California from Jalisco, Mexico. This was in 1992. We were fleeing poverty and persecution in pursuit of a better life, a life without fear. 20 years of hard work in this country were evidence on my mother's Clorox stained clothes and chemical coated hands. It reminded me that we still have much to fight for. And in that moment, as I stared into my mother's eyes, I thought, this is not a victory. There is no work authorization for our parents, no protection from deportation, no safety, no sense of belonging in our community. The risks that my parents took to give my sister and I a chance at a life outside of poverty and starvation, to leave their country, their language, their families cannot be ignored. And it kills me to see that my mother is suffering, working nonstop seven days a week to make ends meet. 
crying from not being able to see my grandfather who was suffering from, from cancer. For my grandmother, my grandmother who has sacrificed so much for our family. Mi abuelita es mi segunda madre. She's my second mother. And she is the most beautiful human being that I've ever known. She is the most beautiful human being who loves to knit. She knits beautiful scarves woven from fine shiny threads. Each thread she weaves carries with it a part of her soul and a piece of her heart and her being. Grandma is a strong, independent woman. She worked alongside my grandfather in the field to help feed their nine children, breaking, sowing, and harvesting the land on which they grew crops. Life was tough, but Grandma knitted her way through the difficult times as if she were needing a shield to protect her family, as if the thread was the bond that kept everyone together. And although there are hundreds of thousands of miles and kilometers between us, we are not separated. We never have been. There is a thread, the strongest thread that ever existed that connects us. A thread that stretches across states and countries, it knows no borders. A thread that is unbreakable, resisting anything that pulls it, anything that tries to destroy it. I long for the day when we'll no longer need this thread. The day when my grandmother and I can need a beautiful scarf, a beautiful blanket out of it. The day when people are no longer confined by borders. But far too much time has passed. Far too many of my loved ones too have passed. And sometimes I can't help but feeling this heavy sensation on my chest as breathing becomes harder and blood rushes to my body like a runaway river. I close my eyes and I feel like giving up. Let the borders that divide us, visible and invisible, that fragment our realities and separate our existence, become ashes in the wind, let it burn. In the agony of mourning, my loved ones from afar, reality and fantasy become one, and I no longer know whether I'm dreaming or I'm awake. I can no longer tell whether I'm speaking or simply thinking. Let it burn. Let this birthday candle burn. I refuse to blow it out. I refuse to make the same wish for the 20th time, wishing for change, to be able to see my loved ones once again. Let it melt like metal against fire. Let it burn. But let me see my loved ones once again. Let me embrace their bodies once again. Let me see their smile once again. I'm hopeful that our country will realize the profound impact that our broken immigration laws have on hardworking, honest families. I'm hopeful that people will wake up to the injustices that are often hidden in plain sight. I'm one of the lucky ones. I have a potential remedy through political asylum. But it kills me. It kills me to know that it's not because of my education, it's not because of my contributions, not because of my teaching, that I'm able to, to have this, this path. It's heartbreaking to know that it's because of my sexual orientation and because of the ghost of my childhood that I'm able to pursue my dreams. And this process has opened so many wounds. Sometimes I think it's better not to remember. This is a dangerous world, but we need to remind ourselves and each other that we're worth so much, so much more than the status, so much more than our pain, even if it often feels like we're stuck because of it. We need to remember that we're always in control. We are the ones who can control our thoughts, our actions, our beliefs, our emotions, our freedom. True freedom lies within ourselves. And these are the things that truly define us. Something that I tell my students often is that whatever path you choose in life, whatever career you decide to pursue, don't lose sight of the bigger picture. Remember that your actions have an impact on others and you should always ask yourself what impact you want your career, your actions, your words to have on the world around you. My words have helped me heal. And this is why I write for myself because it's harder to be undocumented if I document myself. Because I have a voice, and in my voice live my ancestors longing to be heard. Because my truth is my strongest weapon. Because I can no longer wait watching history rewrite itself on my fingers. Because I was born, because I breathe, because I love, because I believe, because I exist, because silence is defeat. I write. For the unaware, sleeping on a burning bed, mesmerized, by the click ring click of technology at their fingertips, oblivious to the dark blue secrets hidden behind their screens, hypnotized by their tarnished empty boxes, distracted by vile devices, disguised as convenience, and they don't see the endless power they hold within themselves. Rise, like dynamite they will rise, and I write for my mother. 
My inextinguishable fire, your silver hair and weathered hands will not go unnoticed. You clean, house after house you clean, you break, leaf after leaf you break, you serve, guest after guest you serve, you will not be discarded, you are love. Within rapid hurricanes, you are a bright light in the darkness of the abyss. You bestow passion among raging volcanoes. You are the reason I write. I mentioned that the reason why I'm able to do the things that I'm most passionate about, like teaching, is because I have so many people who have supported me along the way. So many people who have given so much in order for me to be able to stand before you today. So in closing, I'd like to express my gratitude to some of these people. This is an incomplete list, in no particular order, of the courageous individuals who have supported me. Mrs. Kiasis, Dora Nalmezquita, Mariana Tinoco, Mr. Kong, Mrs. Grace, Viva Hoffman, Kathy Jin, Jorge Ramos, Juan Cochea, Elliot Margulie, Pam Lanky, Mi Padrino Victor Amalar, Mis Padre Rosalia Rodriguez, and Narciso Navarrete, and everyone else whom I haven't mentioned or haven't had the pleasure of meeting, but they've advocated on my behalf. Thank you so much. Ladies and gentlemen, it's been a pleasure to be able to share this space with you. Now, I know that I'm preaching to the choir here, but I want to remind you that your commitment to supporting undocumented young people has a long-lasting and profound impact on individuals you may not even realize. Thank you for thinking and acting critically on the issues that impact the most vulnerable members of our communities. We have a lot of work to do, and we can't do it alone. We will succeed, but we need everyone to take a stand for justice. So please stand up. Please stand up. <laughs> and let's unite. Turn to the person next to you and give them a hug. Because together, we're stronger. Together, we're unstoppable. Juntos lograremos. Have a wonderful evening. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Julio, for your inspirational words and for sharing your experiences with us. As we heard, change in our work requires creativity and must remain conscious of our need to heal, care for each other, and act. As Starship AZ, we have learned, especially in the last year and a half, that our intended goal for ma making education accessible to all, regardless of immigration status, cannot be reached if we don't focus on families. Our next stories explain why our parents and our families are essential to our growth as a community. Please welcome back our MC, Cynthia Diaz. Hi everyone. My name is Cynthia Diaz, and I am currently seven, 18 years old. <laughs> I recently turned 18, so I forget. So, two years ago, I was a sophomore in high school. I was 15 at the time when something changed my life completely. It was a Saturday morning at 7 a.m. My dad screaming my name. He was like, Cynthia, Cynthia. And I was still asleep. And he usually wakes me up to watch something on TV. I thought it was like a funny commercial, something that maybe SpongeBob was doing. So I was like, whatever, I need my sleep. But then he says, Cynthia, Cynthia. They're taking your mom. Se están llevando tu mamá. And I was confused. I was like, what's going on? So then I woke up, got my slippers on. As I didn't see my mom or dad in the living room, so I went outside in our front yard. And there I saw my mom in handcuffs being taken into a van, an ice van. And I was like, what's going on? I saw about 15 ice officers. They were undercover because their vehicle was not, didn't say anything about ice. It was just a regular mini minivan. And the officers were, they had their ice vest, but they weren't very, I don't know, I, I couldn't tell who they were. So then I asked my dad what was going on. And the officer replied for him. He's like, don't say anything. We're taking your mom, you guys know what she did. Um, call a lawyer, do whatever you want, but we're taking your mom. So then I was, I couldn't come up with any words. I was so shocked. And my dad was trying to talk to the officer because my dad was just as confused as I was. My dad was like, what's going on? And then the officer was 
was attacking my dad. He was like, don't say anything. Did you help her cross here illegally? And basically the officer was trying to get my dad as well. So then my dad just didn't say anything. As we watched the officers close the door on my mom, I saw my mom still in her PJs. She was still undressed. And she still, her hair was a mess. She had just woken up. So then they took my mom, just like that, in 10 minutes. I checked my clock and it was 7.10 a.m. We didn't know what to do. We tried calling our lawyer, but it was a Saturday morning, so our lawyer was gone for the weekend. So we had to wait until Monday. My mom was well aware of what was going on in the community, so she knew not to sign any papers and not to talk to anyone. On Sunday afternoon, after 24 hours, we got a call from my mom. She was in Nogales, Mexico. We didn't know how to take this. <laughs> I was only 15 at the time. I have a younger brother who's 13, and my dad who works all day, basically. And now we didn't have a mom. And I, as the only woman in the house, I had to step up and take a role. I, I was in an honors high school, so I had so much homework and so many projects to do. And when I had to go home, I had to cook and do chores because my mom wasn't there anymore. But I knew I couldn't just stay there and try to, try to make it through high school like this. So I, I had to reach out. I asked for family members to help me with my cooking and with my chores because I was so busy being an honors high school student. I also reached out to the community to see if anyone was able to help me. I'm from Phoenix, so um, for the next, for the following year, I interned for Puente Human Rights Organization, and I also interned for Arizona Dream Act Coalition. There, I gained experience, and I realized that I was not the only one with this struggle. I was not the only one who was being separated from their mom or dad. I'm also a U.S. citizen, so I never thought this immigration issue would happen to me because I'm a U.S. citizen, and I only thought this immigration issue was only happening to undocumented people, people who did not have papers like I do. Because I'm here sharing my story, and because I'm a U.S. citizen, I just want to share and give a point that this clearly affects everyone, and there's no excuse for you to not get involved. Just because you are documented, there's no excuse for you to reach out to those people who do need help. I needed help, and luckily I got that help. My mom is still in Mexico, and I continue to fight for her every day. I'm at, I'm at the U of A right now. But I'm currently, currently fighting, and luckily I found Scholarship CZ where I continue to fight for my mom and hopefully bring her back someday because I truly miss her. And I know my dad and my brother do too, without a woman in the house right now. And this is about family, and this is about familia. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Ana Hernandez, and tonight I want to speak to you about my story with the importance of family. On April 4th of 2013, I was in school. My tennis match had just ended, and I was definitely ready to go home and get some rest. <coughs> it had been too long of a day with bus rides, homework, matches. I called my mom. I asked her if she could pick me up, and she said, yeah. She said she would be there. And I waited. I began to worry when over a half hour passed and she still wasn't there. My brother then arrived instead of my mom. I never would have thought that his pale face, his silence, and his great urgency to just get somewhere was because my mom, just a few miles away, was inside the Border Patrol's car, cubs on, tears rolling, and worry was written across her face.
She said she would be okay, that she loved us, that she'd be back soon, she'd be back home. But those are the words of a mother to her worried kids, right? <laughs> My mind was blank at that time. I didn't know what to do. I didn't know who to contact. I called Matt. <laughs> that night, I messaged him on Facebook and told him what had just happened. I had no idea what to do. And he, him, he got back to me as quick as possible. It was like 11 at night and he was just like, what's going on? I'm here to help you. The next morning, the scholarships AZ crew got together and all of them decided to call the Border Patrol agency asking for my mom's release. At the time, it was a relief because I had no idea what to do, yet this group was there to help me. On the third day, my mom called us early in the morning. Again, she said she was okay and to not worry, that she loved us and things would get better. That was all. Even though she had called, we still had no idea where she was headed. Maybe a lawyer, maybe Florence. Nobody knew, or at least nobody would tell us. It was a frustrating situation to know that these agents knew where my mom was, yet she was being denied to us, her own family. She was being kept captive, but there was no ransom to free her from the hands of these so-called peacemakers. In those few days that I told the same story multiple times, and each time I spoke each word, the memory of her in the Border Patrol car came rushing back. I felt defeated. I had taken a blow to the gut when she was taken away and I was about to collapse from it. But the look of hope and the great support from the community helped me cling on to hope. The hope that I would see her back home again with my brother and my niece. Even though my mom was gone for only a few days, it felt like years had gone by. The clock ticked slower in those four days. Time just passed so slowly. During, those, during that time, I cried many times. In that time, all I could do was pray. In those four days, in those 96 hours of dread, I encountered the darkest days of my life. Hello, my name is Mirta Osuna. I am originally from Navajo, Mexico. It is an honor to be standing here in front of you all and be able to share a little part of my story. Fue en diciembre del 2002 cuando tomé la decisión de venir a vivir a este país. Cuando ingresamos a este país, nos fuimos a vivir a un pequeño pueblo llamado Booker, Texas. On December 2002 is when I took the decision to come to this country. When we first came in, we decided to move to a small town called Brooker, located in Texas. Recuerdo que esas vacaciones fueron un poco difíciles para mi hijo, quien supo que iba a ingresar a una nueva escuela, nuevos amigos, pero sobre todo un nuevo idioma, el cual era completamente desconocido para él. Pero lo más interesante fue el primer día de escuela que al salir lo primero que dijo, Mami, yo nunca me quiero ir de este país y hasta la fecha aquí estamos. I remember that winter break was hard for my son, who knew he was coming into a new school, new friends, and overall having to learn a new language, which was unknown to him. But what was the most interesting thing was on his first day of school, when he came out, he told me, Mom, I never want to leave this country, and until this day, here we are. Para mí es muy importante la educación de mis hijos y trato de hablar con ellos sobre la importancia de la educación y el tener un título universitario. Y la razón por la que siempre he estado involucrado en todas las escuelas a las que ellos han asistido. To me it is very important for my kids to have good education and I try to talk to them about the importance of having an education and getting a degree. And the reason I always get involved in my kids' schools that they have intended Es porque sí hay una diferencia entre los niños que tienen el apoyo de sus padres y los que no. 
Les puedo decir en lo personal que mis hijos han sido muy buenos estudiantes y muy buenos hijos. Trato de estar siempre involucrada en las actividades para que ellos sientan mi apoyo. Esa fue una meta que yo me puse muchísimo antes de que yo fuera madre, porque a mí me hubiera gustado que mis padres se involucraran un poco más en nuestra educación. It's because there is a difference in the kids who have the support of their parents and the ones who don't. I can tell you that my kids have been very good students and amazing kids. I always try to be very involved in their activities so that they can feel my support. That was one of my goals that I set myself to even before I was a mother, because I would have liked that my parents would have been more involved in my education. Y quiero que mis hijos sepan que son muy importantes en mi vida. También he aprendido mucho sobre todos los programas en los que he asistido. Con ellos tuve el privilegio de pertenecer al programa de Family Literacy, a un programa de la universidad llamado Semela. I want my kids to know that they are very important to me. I have also learned many things at the programs I have assisted. I was able to be part of Family Literacy and a program from the University of Arizona called Semela. Pero sobre todo, he aprendido a comprender el sistema educativo de este país. Ahora para mí es un privilegio estar apoyando a mi hijo en la organización de Scholarship AC para poder brindar apoyo a todo aquel que lo necesite. Overall, I have learned to understand the education system of this country, and now it is an honor to be supporting my son in the organization Scholarship AC and be able to bring support to all those who need it. Gracias. Thank you. Did you ever walk into a room and um, after something went really well, and you kind of know that moment when you feel like there's almost like theme music that should be playing? Has anybody ever experienced that, where you feel like you should have some music playing behind you, right when you walk in? Some of you now think I'm just really strange. So, but uh, but you should try it, right? Because it's it's always that moment where you feel like you're just really good, that something is is going really right, and and that whatever you're doing is right, no matter what it is. You can make mistakes, it doesn't really matter. You're still on the right path, no matter what it is. That's really how I feel about our organization. Um, at Scholarships AZ, we've been around a little more than four years. Uh, we make a lot of mistakes. We mess up all the time. But we know what we're doing is absolutely right. And we know that what we're doing has to happen because it doesn't exist anywhere else. We've been working hard for over four years to address the inequities in our education and immigration systems. And while I have this invincible feeling sometimes where I should have some theme music playing, I remember that even though we made those mistakes, and even though sometimes we may not have that right answer, it's okay. Despite all of this, we've been willing to take our risks and move forward. At Scholarships AZ, we're creating a place where our community continues to work together to ensure that everyone has access to their educational goals. That's what we do. It's in our blood as students, as activists, as teachers, as parents, as families. Our community is absolutely worth it. In our fight for equity, I want to give you a sense of what we've done, what we've been up to for this last year and give you a sense of where your financial, your physical, and your abilities to share things on Facebook have helped us and helped our community. Just in this year alone, of all the funds that we've raised throughout the year, over 73% of those funds go directly to scholarships and leadership and professional development for students in our community. Of our active scholarships AZ leaders, those students have received over $42,000 in scholarships because of the work that they put in to find those, that information and apply, and the work that our team and that you out there do to make sure that they are applying and have access to it and know how to write those essays in the best way possible 
and are getting involved in your organizations like at Pima Community College and the University of Arizona and throughout the community to make sure they have something to write that essay about and something that absolutely changes their lives. This year alone, as Sarah mentioned before, uh, we had worked and partnered with the Tucson Youth Poetry Slam for the Sonia Dora Sablan uh, grant program. We also launched the first transfer guide dedicated to undocumented students to help them get out of that pipeline where a lot of students end up getting stuck at the community college. That transfer guide was designed by a student who faced so many barriers and applied to over 16 different universities to transfer with a well over 3.5 GPA, numbers and numbers of organizations she had leadership roles in, and still was not just wasn't unable to get into institutions, but was unable to pay the extraordinary amounts of money to get into those schools, despite schools saying that they were accessible. $50,000 a year is not accessible to anyone, I think, around the table. And if not, then we need to talk to you as a donor. <laughs> it's not possible. So what she did is take her time and build a guide and teach students how to go find the resources, how to find the money and make sure that we're developing a stronger list of schools that is accurate and that is actually affordable for students to make it into when they transfer. That student is Alexandra Samaron. She's not here with us tonight, but she has spent numerous, numerous hours putting this entire guide together. So we can give her a round of applause. We've also learned, and I've been taught this many, many times by some leaders on our team, including Alejandro Castellar, who teaches me all the time, and we need to make sure we are not just focused on higher education. We are not just focused on you going to college and that is it. We need to make sure you get through college. We also need to make sure that the students who don't have the GED to get into school get the GED. And so our team has developed and we continue to send out to the rest of the country a comprehensive GED guide for undocumented students to make sure that they are able to find and access the GED programs that they need in their communities in order to qualify for things like deferred action. A couple other key points is um, you'll meet these two wonderful folks in a couple of minutes, but we had two students uh, who were selected to be Dream Summer interns. And as a result of that, for about two months, a little more than two months, they put in uh, 40 hours a week with our organization. And it was a paid internship run as a collaboration between the UCLA Labor Center uh, and Dream Resource Center, as well as United We Dream. And they were able to accomplish basically what you're sitting at tonight. How many of you are enjoying the dinner? That's the work of students who've been putting in this time to make sure you have a place in the community with us and working with us. The final thing I'll talk about as a major highlight for us is what we did at Pima Community College this year. And this is by far our biggest accomplishment so far as a young organization. Back in October of last year, our team had decided and talked with each other and said, we really need to work on this in-state tuition thing because school is simply not affordable here. And I'm tired of paying out-of-state tuition, which is five times more than an in-state student pays. And by the way, I graduate with those students in my high school. And that's what I often hear from students who are paying out-of-state tuition at things like Pima Community College. <coughs> and what the students basically did is they organized for four months and they met with board members such as Sylvia Lee, who's here with us tonight, and other board members and said, look, this is what we need to do. We need in-state tuition right now for students. You've got thousands of students who want to get into this institution. We need to make this happen. And so they did. And some of you sitting around here tonight came to a room in February of this year that held 75 people. We packed that room with 200. We filled the other room of overflow and fed a bunch of families and said, look, we're all here as a community and we're going to need this to happen right now. And the board not only said, sure, uh, what are we supposed to do with this? They actually took what was an agenda item 19 and moved it to number one and said, okay, we'll listen to the community. And the community members, one after another, said, you need to make this happen. And because of that night, because of our work as a community, and this is all of our accomplishments, Pima Community College offers in-state tuition to DACA students, students who have deferred action. And that deserves a lot of that. I can go on with a lot of accomplishments of what we've done. 
But I'll leave you with this. Our work is never really done in anything that we do here. Sometimes that's really actually unfortunate for what we're doing because we know that at some point we need to get this equity. We need to make a system that actually works for everyone. But I, I want you to keep in mind that Scholarships AZ is not just about making the difference in the life of a student. It's about making a difference in the life of an entire community. We're about giving resources to get an education and getting you involved to change both our broken education system and immigration system. We're about discussing important issues like the glaring connections between education and the private prison industrial complex in Arizona. We're about making sure our immigrant brothers and sisters in the community who risk themselves every day in Arizona simply because they are undocumented in a state that warrants nothing less than being a citizen. And for activists, some of whom are here tonight, who stop an Operation Streamline court system for days because they chain themselves to a bus, we need to make sure they're recognized. Education is not simply about getting a 4.0. It's not simply about joining a club, as you've heard some of these stories tonight. Education is absolutely about our community and our families. We are at a pivotal moment in our history, and unfortunately, we've actually been there for a long time. We can continue to move forward with, with new ideas, or we can use the old ones that we know don't work. And we can simply just sit back and hope that it fixes our system one day. We're choosing to move forward with new ideas, and we hope you are too. <laughs> Our accomplishments this year have led us to an important point. At a time when we are fighting to keep things like in-state tuition alive, when we're fighting to get students back into school and to get their GED. Our fight right now in our organization is really being led by two of our community's most talented leaders. And now you have the privilege to learn a little bit more about their stories of perseverance and absolute determination to make all of our lives better. Please welcome Anna and Jessica. Hello everyone, my name is Anna Rodriguez. And growing up, I always knew I was undocumented, but I didn't really quite understand that that meant that I had limited opportunities for jobs and for school. And that became really apparent when I turned 18. And all of the universities and colleges that had once granted me a lot of opportunities were now taking them away and their scholarships with them. So I decided to move back to Mexico with my sister. My mom begged and pleaded with me and said, just wait one year to see what can happen with the immigration system. Finally, I conceded to this, and I decided to make the best of it. I applied for a scholarship and was granted it. I attended my first semester at Pima Community College and joined Scholarships AZ, but I was still lost, and I wanted to move back to Mexico. So I broke the promise that I had made my mother, and I dropped my second semester. And in, during my second semester, as many of you know, I was ready to move back to Mexico in March. And my sister wasn't ready for me until June. In June 15, 2012, deferred action was announced. That day, my heart broke. My mother looked at me in the eyes and said, Ves, por eso te quedaste. See, si, this is why you stay. I had betrayed the one person that had believed in me, in my dreams, and had gotten all the rewards. So I decided to fight for her. I began to organize in my community by tabling, by talking to people one-on-one, -on -one, by attending national conferences and teaching at them as well. And I know that a lot of you are in this fight with me. I know that Scholarships AZ is a very small piece of the national fight for human rights. And we need all of you tonight, all of these sectors, in order to create and radicalize change. We need the food justice, we need human rights, we need educational and immigration rights, and we need all other sectors. So I will continue to fight for the rights of myself, 
of my family, and of my community. And I hope that when I do so, I see you all there right next to me. My name is Ana Rodriguez. I am undocumented, unafraid, and unapologetic. Mi nombre es Jessica Garcia. I was born in Chihuahua, Chihuahua, Mexico. I came to the United States when I was 13, 13 years old. I came here and worked as hard as I could, exceeding math, science, and history, during my middle school and high school education. During high school, I decided to stay because in Mexico, the crime was unbelievable. I was told that college was going to be expensive and a challenge due to Proposition 200. And still, I decided to stay and to finish my educational career. I found very helpful and key people in my life to attend college. Last year, I had a jail time. I, I was going to leave Arizona. It was, wearing, it was getting too long to finish my associates and a community college. My deadline was on my birthday. I was going really old. The day of my birthday, June 15, DACA was announced. And once again, I decided to stay. But this time, I decided to stay to create a change to spread the word that nothing can stop anyone from pursuing your own life desires. I came back to school at CCZ exactly a year ago in a dinner like this. Now, not only to be a member, but to be a leader and create this change. I was asked to sit on the table with Board of Governors at Pima Community College. Without any experience, I say yes because I knew that institution for DACA recipients needed to happen. I have been sitting in the ship, I have seen, I have been sitting with the share of the Arizona border regions. And to be honest with you all, I don't want to finish my bachelor's in five years. I have organized meetings, fundraisers, and dinners, all with only one goal to make higher education accessible to all. I definitely think that uh, Anna and Jessica deserve another round of applause. For so much this part that we're jumping to in the agenda is really funny for me because it's, uh, I think it's one of our most exciting parts because we talk about now where we're going and where we need you to be with us in all this work. Um, and it gets to that moment in time, I know, where we get anxious and antsy and ready to go, and it's a little cold outside, and I get it, I get it. All right, but here's what I'm thinking. So, as a community, do you believe that the work that we're doing is important? Yes. Do you believe that we need to do more? Yes. In the next few months, Scholarships AZ will launch its first scholarship and microloan programs in order to provide new sources of funding to students, regardless of immigration status. A large portion of tonight's money goes straight to funding those programs. So if you won a prize in the back for the auction, make sure you pay us. In the next few weeks, we are actually working on finalizing our contract right now with United We Dream and the Dream Educational Empowerment Project, also known as DEEP. This is an organization um, that is the largest immigrant youth-led organization in the country. And DEEP as a program is something we've been a part of for about a year and a half. But what we have finally done with this contract with them is we've been selected as one of five sites out of 52 affiliate organizations in the country to launch the first ever Dream Resource Center. With United We Dream's financial support and your support tonight, we are establishing stipends for student leaders, many of whom are here tonight and serving you drinks in the back and serving you food all evening, who commit their time to leading our parents, our students, educator, and community committees. Through this center, we will connect our parents to the necessary resources, strengthen our scholarship workshops in local high schools, 
and train students to make it into and through college. In the spring, we will launch Arizona's first Dream Educational Empowerment Conference for students, educators, and community leaders. This day will be dedicated to making sure educators across the state have the necessary resources and the training to support the educational goals of all students, including our undocumented leaders. We're basically trying to make edu educators be like Sylvia Lee, like Mark Hanna, who's here tonight, like other educators out there like Rudy McCormick, and making sure that everyone is being a resource because that's what we signed up to do as educators. We're there to help students make it in and through school. And finally, as we've done in the past, we are sending another powerful team of young leaders to participate in the annual United We Dream Congress and other leadership conferences around the country. Not only do our leaders attend, but they present workshops and teach their peers about the need to look at educational access when looking to immigration reform proposals. Our team continues to spread knowledge on communities across the state and the country so all students are included in all policy decisions that impact our communities. Not only is Scholarships AZ obviously helping students locally, but we're doing big things nationally. What do you think about that? As an organization, that's where we're heading. Are you with us? So it seemed like that table was, and maybe half of that. Rudy McCormick, you still here? Yes, I am. You with us? Yes, sir. Sylvia Lee, you with us? Yes. Daisy, you with us? Yes. Mark Hanna, you still with us? I am. All right. Peter, you gonna come with us? You gonna work with us? Yeah. All right. Who else am I gonna call out? <laughs> What's that? Carrie. Carrie. Oh no, she be left. <laughs> Carrie, Carrie's with us though. Carrie's with us. Danita, are you with us? Yes. yes. All right. Imelda. Imelda, are you with us? <laughs> I like to hear the voices in the distance when I can't see anybody. We are a community of absolute strength and power. We can change things in our community. When people sit back and say that we just can't do it, it's just how it is, we're too tired, I think about the students who ran into a school board meeting at TUSD, chained themselves to it, to the desks, and basically said, no, 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 hold on. This is what we're going to do for our education. I think about the community and the students really in this organization who said, hold on, I've got deferred action and really you're not going to give me in-state tuition? Watch this. And go into a meeting and say, look, you're going to make this happen. With the help of powerful leaders like Sylvia Lee and other leaders in our community who are making these things happen for us. And with us. I think of the times when students are struggling with something around immigration issues and we're able to contact lawyers out there like Claudia Bevelo, Mo Goldman, Doralina Skidmore, other folks who are able to basically come and help us and say, look, we're just going to give you those answers. We're going to figure that out with you. Because education is not just about school. It's about every other part of those stories that you've heard tonight. And I, get, I have the privilege every day to hear these stories all the time. You had the privilege tonight to hear it once, and I hope that you continue to interact with the students on our team, with the leaders in our community who spoke with you tonight and who been serving food to you tonight so hard to make sure you know we need you in our fight. We need your work. So I'll ask you one more time. Are you with us? Yeah. Are you with us? Yeah.